Right. Well, we're at just about 3.33 by my clock here. So we'll go ahead and get started for this afternoon. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to all of you for being here with me on this Wednesday at 3.30 in the afternoon Central Time. Uh, my name is Nicole Grenan. I'm a public archaeologist and research associate with the Florida Public Archaeology Network, and I'm based here in beautiful Pensacola, Florida. Our Zoom into Archaeology program is something that we started last year, as you can imagine, to try and bring some of our educational programs and content online when we couldn't meet with people in person. And it's been such a success for us that we've decided to keep doing it um, at least twice a month. So welcome to our first talk for November. I I'm, appreciate you being here with me this afternoon. Before we get started, I just want to go over a couple of Zoom etiquette things real quick. Um, most of this you probably all know at this point. Um, if you could keep your microphones off during the talk, that's really helpful. I'm going to record this presentation for people who can't come and be here at 3.30 in the afternoon on a Wednesday. Um, so we're going to put that up on our YouTube channel afterward. And so if we can cut down on the, the background interference, that helps people who are streaming it a little bit later and clears up the audio for other people in the room. It looks like almost everyone has their cameras off. That also helps too. It prevents you from being recorded as part of the presentation so that people who are watching it later can, can pay attention to the presentation itself. Um, we also have a really great chat function in Zoom. Most of you have probably used this before. If you click on the chat button, the chat box will pop up. I'm happy to answer any questions or comments you might have during the presentation. You can go ahead and just throw them in that chat box and then I'll make sure to answer them in the order that they were asked before um, I wrap up for the day. So at the end of the presentation, you're also welcome at the end of the presentation to unmute your mic and just ask the questions as well. I'm um, hearing a voice sometimes is really nice. So I don't feel like I'm just talking to myself. I know some of you might be here for extra credit purposes for classes if you have professors at the University of West Florida. I know some are offering extra credit for being here. Um, we'll do the same thing that we've done in the past. If you could just at the end of the presentation, go ahead and write your name and your professor's name in the chat box and I'll go ahead and make sure that's submitted for you. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see the presentation for today. Um, if someone could just give me maybe a thumbs up or a nod that they're seeing the presentation screen, I would appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you, Renee. Excellent. Okay, well, let's get right into it. Um, again, thank you for joining me today because we've got a great presentation about one of my absolute favorite shipwrecks and dive spots here in Northwest Florida, um, and that's the shipwreck of San Pablo. If you're in the Northwest Florida area, um, you probably have heard this shipwreck referred to as the Russian freighter. I'm guilty of even calling it that myself sometimes. Um, not to disappoint anyone too much right off of the bat, but the ship was not Russian in any sense. Actually, its history, I think, is far more interesting than that, really, as you will begin to see. Um, San Pablo, just to give you a kind of a brief introduction to the ship, it actually began its life in Belfast, Ireland in 1915. It's about 315 feet long and about 44 feet wide or had a 40 foot beam, 44 foot beam. Um, she was primarily a fruit transport ship during the early part of her life, going between Central America and the United States, what we would often call a banana boat. Um, during World War II, she was sunk by a German U-boat off of Costa Rica. At that time, she was refloated and towed to Florida to take place in what would become a secret military operation. And that's mostly what our presentation is gonna focus on today. Um, so the presentation will give you details about that military operation and how it created the popular San Pablo dive spot off Pensacola. We'll also see a couple of videos, and this is what I'm most excited about. One of these videos dates to the 1944 sinking of the vessel. So it's a real treat to be watching that historic footage. Um, and another video is of a more recent dive visit to the site. So you'll get to see what the dive site looks like today if you are not a local diver. So San Pablo the shipwreck took place in an operation called Project Campbell. 
And Project Campbell was a secret, not top secret, but a secret mission of the Office of Strategic Services. And this essentially was the predecessor of the CIA. So this was an office that was working during World War II. A lot of the information that we have about Project Campbell and kind of the end of San Pablo's life comes from the report from Project Campbell that was published in September 1944. That report was eventually made public in 1965, which is why we now have a copy of it. And a lot of the images that you're going to see in the next few slides are lifted straight from that report that was declassified in 1965. Now, Project Campbell was essentially conceived of as a way to end the war in the Pacific against the Japanese empire, right? Um, there, the United States um, and the OSS had its fingers in lots of different plans at that point. How can we get this war to end? It needs to be over. The loss of life has been too great. What can we do without sacrificing even more American or allied lives? Um, Operation Campbell was not implemented. And that's because there was another operation that took precedence because of its ability to um, essentially to prevent loss of life uh, on, on the U.S. side. And that operation, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, it was called the Manhattan Project. And of course, the Manhattan Project was the development of nuclear weapons and its first use um, in on our planet at the time. So Manhattan Project took precedence. It was eventually what ended the war, but Project Campbell, I guess, was in the back burner just in case uh, Manhattan Project didn't end up working out. So the mission of Operation Campbell, again, lifted straight from that report, the mission was to sabotage enemy targets inaccessible to other methods of attack. In the report, they write that these targets protected by inner and outer harbor defenses are best approachable by operational ruse and deception. Now, essentially, what Operation Campbell wanted to do was to get remote controlled um, detonation devices, explosives into Japanese harbors and attack Japanese naval craft where they were sitting in harbor. Right. How do we get in there and get out without any loss of life, um, but also make it very effective operationally with right? the most bang for your buck, as it were. Now, the report's broken up into several di different sections, the first being the missile. And so this is what they're using to describe the tool that they're going to use to essentially penetrate these harbor defenses in Japan. And so what they wanted to do was describe military watercraft, um, A2 hacker craft, the A3 hacker craft, and an army rescue boat, which you can see those pictures there of those three. I'll go over their specs here in a minute. Um, but they wanted to take these small craft and disguise them. And we'll go into that in a second. And those, these disguised craft were then loaded with explosives and steered toward a target vessel. Again, this probably would have been a large naval vessel, battleship, things like that. Um, they could be controlled in two different ways. The first way was obviously manual control, having a person in these disguised craft steering it towards the target. And if, in the report, it's described as kind of a James Bond move. They would essentially jump out of these small watercraft before they reach their target and swim to safety. Now, what's the problem with that? Of course, they're still in a Japanese harbor. And so these Americans who are jumping out of, you know, moving watercraft are still going to have to find safety within Japanese inner harbors. So I think the more viable option was really remote control. And the idea was that you would have a plane or a larger mothership offshore, a submarine or someone on shore to remote control these disguised vehicles, watercraft, towards their target vessels. And so this is actually what they ended up using, which I think is much cooler and more high tech. Now they call these vessels um, the missiles and then the the machinery or the technology that they were essentially using to control them, they called those the remote control. And this is, you know, terminology we kind of still use today when we talk about these kinds of things. Here are the specs on the various craft that they were using. The largest that they would have used as a disguised craft was the Army Rescue Boat at about 85 feet long. And that's a sizable boat. You can see in the report, they estimate that about 50,000 pounds of explosives can be loaded onto these Army Rescue Boats. The smaller boats were the hacker craft, the A3 and the A2, um, the A3 holding about 10,000 pounds of explosives and the A2 
holding about 5,000 pounds of explosives. And these vessels were much smaller in the order somewhere of 34 to 37 feet, um, but still effective as we'll see. So essentially here are diagrams lifted from the report showing you essentially what they've put together to make this remote control thing work. So you have your disguised vessel right here. Um, on that vessel are the explosives, of course, your ordnance, um, but there's also a radio antenna. And for the purposes of, of this particular test for Operation Campbell um, and San Pablo, they were using an aircraft as their remote control point. So they had their um, transceivers and all of this located on the aircraft, a radio receiver on the boat, radio controlled steering on the boat, and then from the plane they would be steering this thing toward its target. Now the explosives on the boat, this is also very interesting, there were two different kinds of explosives being used. So the first kind of explosive on these craft was what they called a pinup device. And this would often be loaded somewhere towards the front of the vessel. If it had a bowsprit on their disguise, they would be put in the bowsprit. And this contained two different things. It had two essentially steel holding pins that once this craft reached the target, those holding pins would essentially punch holes into the side of the target vessel, holding the disguised watercraft there. And then those holding pins or that pinup device would detonate a scuttling charge so that this disguised small watercraft would sink below the surface of the water while it was still attached to whatever its target vessel was. Now, once it was below the water, once it got to about 25 feet, the main charges on that vessel would explode. And again, this was somewhere in the order of 5,000 plus pounds of explosives. Um, and the idea was that since those explosives exploded below the waterline, it would just pop a giant hole in whatever the target vessel was and sink it while it was in port in the harbor. So here's a good diagram of what I was just trying to do with my hands there. So here you have your disguised watercraft essentially bumping right up to the side of the target vessel. Those that uh, pinup device would throw out those um, scuttling pins or the, um, I'm sorry, the steel holding pins ignite the scuttling charge, sinking the watercraft below the surface of the water. And then once it was there, it would explode and essentially create a giant hole in the side of that target craft. What's interesting is that, um, you know, the, the team that was putting this together essentially said you could use whatever explosives you had available. So, you know, whatever, I think how they, they described it as whatever was as available in the theater of operations. So this could include depth charges, depth bombs, TNT, Torpex, Tetratol, C2, aerial bombs, or <laughs> what they call other explosives. Can everyone hear me okay? Must have had a bad connection there. Okay, thank you for giving me the thumbs up. I'm, I blinked out for a second there. Let me share my screen again, just as it was getting good, right? That's how it always happens. All right. And then if you could give me maybe one more thumbs up if you see the correct slide, that would be great. Okay, thank you, Renee, I appreciate that. Perfect, okay, so just as it's getting good. They've got lots of different explosives they can use. Really, it's a scrappy team. They can pull together whatever they need to create um, you know, these explosions and target their enemy craft. So now for the fun part, or what I think is the fun part, the disguise. I mentioned that these smaller um, the hacker craft, the army rescue boats, they were disguising them. And essentially what they wanted to do was disguise these smaller craft as native craft. So that when they entered these harbors, in particular the Japanese inner harbor, they wouldn't look like anything special. They certainly wouldn't look like they were loaded with tons of explosives uh, from the US, right? Um, and so they came up with all of these different kinds of, of methods of disguising these. Not all of them are Japanese. They just had you know, many different examples. Uh, a Mandalay wood boat, a Cantonese harbor craft, an Irrawaddy river steamer. And then of course on the left, you can see how those craft are disguised underneath. Um, 
So really interesting stuff. I mean, they were very elaborate in their descriptions of all of this and it's, it's endlessly fascinating. One of the most popular disguises that they would use were fishing vessels because these were vessels that were coming in and out of harbors every day. Um, they had the freedom of the harbor, um, but what they would have to do is they would have to muffle the speedboat engines from the hacker craft and from the army rescue boats. Um, so there was a lot of engineering that went into these as well as we will see. Now the test in Pensacola or off of Pensacola rather, um, the first test of Project Campbell was done in summer of 1944. So again, we're nearing the end of the war. The US is looking for a way to end the war quickly and without more loss of life. Operation Campbell was a potential. Essentially what they wanted to do during this test off of Pensacola was check the maneuverability of the remote control, the seaworthiness of the disguised vessel, the reality of the disguise, whether or not it looked like it was supposed to, and really the ability of the project to actually sink an enemy ship. So what they did for this test was they did, they took with the smaller vessel, an A2 hacker craft, and they disguised it as a Danish fishing vessel from Copenhagen. And so, what we've got here on the top image are those fishing vessels in Copenhagen. And then in this image here, we have the actual craft that they were using here off of Pensacola. So that's that A2 disguised as a Danish fishing boat. Not bad, right? Now what they did or what they wanted to do was they wanted to remote control this A2 described as a fishing, uh, disguised as a fishing boat. They wanted to destroy San Pablo. So San Pablo, you know, it was refloated after it was sunk by that German U-boat. It was brought to Tampa, essentially determined that it was, you know, beyond any kind of repair that it could be used again. They brought it to Pensacola for this test. And so their mission was to destroy this 5,000 ton freighter that was about anchored about nine miles off the Pensacola coast. So here's a diagram of what they did. Um, they, you know, basically just showing you again, the outline of the craft within the disguised um, Danish fishing vessel. It shows you how they uh, disguise that pinup device, the one that has the, the steel holding pins and the scuttling charge <clears throat> wiring that's in the bowsprit of the vessel. The apparatus that they use to disguise um, the sound of the vessel and, um, you know, get kind of, dissipate some of the smokes that it looked actually like a sailing fishing vessel. And then of course, no disguise would be complete without a dummy of a Danish fisherman sitting in the cockpit moving, um, you know, controlling the tiller essentially back there. So really good stuff. Again, very, very detailed disguise here. Um, they also, you know, as you can see here, they would throw in, you know, nets and barrels and anything else that you would find on a fishing craft. Now we talked a little bit about um, San Pablo already. I mentioned that she was built in 1915 in Belfast um, by the Workman Clark and Company. Um, she was 315 feet long. She had a 44 foot beam and she could hold about 5,000 tons. So she's no small vessel, um, a large steel freighter. She was employed by the United Fruit Company and brought fruit back and forth from Central America to the United States, sunk off those German, sunk by those German U-boats off Costa Rica in 1942. She was refloated, but eventually determined to be a catastrophic loss and so donated to the cause here in the U.S. Um, it was, you know, at the time that she sank from the German U-boats, it was, she was in port off of Costa Rica, and it was kind of a, a, a perceived as a big issue that German U-boats actually made it into inner harbor defenses off Costa Rica. It was the closest attack to the Panama Canal, so within about 220 miles of the Panama Canal. And if you know, you know, if you're familiar with the United States economics at the time, Pan Panama Canal was critical for supplying the war effort, both in the Pacific and the Atlantic. And so, you know, losing Panama Canal or having devastating losses there would have been very problematic for the United States and the Allies. Um, so it was a big deal when San Pablo sank. But she did her job and was donated to the war effort. The operational test of Operation Campbell was selected or decided to be on August 11th, 1944. And we're, we see here some photos. We have a photo of San Pablo. That's the target freighter. She's just kind of sitting there waiting for 
for the disguised fishing craft to come by. They had that A2 fishing, Danish fishing vessel loaded with little less than 5,000 pounds of Torpex explosives. So if you remember, 5,000 pounds was the max that that vessel could carry. So we have somewhere closer to 4,000 pounds on the vessel at the time. They piloted <clears throat> the Danish fishing vessel via remote control from a B-17 aircraft that took off from Pensacola. Um, and so you can see in this little inset, the the route that they made that Danish fishing vessel go. Again, remember they were attempting to test the maneuverability of the vessel. So they did their you know, curly cues and zigzags to make sure that it all worked really, really well via remote control. Um, what's fascinating is that it worked. It absolutely worked. San Pablo sank in under two minutes once that Dan Danish fishing vessel hit its side. And so, you know, the steel holding pins worked, the scuttling charge worked, and then when the watercraft was below the surface, was a, that a larger explosion went off with those 4,000 pounds of Torpex, and it worked. It punched a massive hole in the side of San Pablo, and the, the larger image that you see here in the background is San Pablo exploding. Um, after the fact, you know, upon investigation of the wreck, they found that these explosives put a 40 foot by 20 foot hole in the side of the vessel. And so that's no small feat. That's pretty impressive. Um, again, San Pablo was a big metal hulled vessel. It was no wooden fishing craft. Um, What's interesting is that on some of the, the, the commentary for the operation, some of the folks who actually watched it no, mentioned that the, the geyser of water that you see in this photo here came up approximately 600 feet high during that explosion. So again, no small thing. So the next slide, what I've got for you is a video. And I, I kind of went back and forth on including it. I cut it down a little bit, but it is really interesting. It is the promotional video released to the US military from the Project Campbell team. And so it's very 1940s, including the narrator's voice. So I think, it, you know, it's kind of a historical document unto itself. So not as only does it go through some details of the operation, it shows you video of what's going on. It also eventually shows you the explosion itself. Unfortunately, the video that I was able to find, the audio cuts out right before the explosion, which, you know, the most important part is to kind of hear the narrator. So that's not such a big deal. The explosion kind of speaks for itself, um, but just know that. So um, make sure if you don't have your audio turned on, which you probably do if you're listening to me talk, but keep that audio on because you're definitely gonna wanna hear the narration in this video. If you're having trouble hearing it, let me know. text is a lot of what we've talked about already. I just included it because, you know, it just, again, it's a historical record unto itself here. Starboard targets are hard to get at, hard to hit. Your defense presents special tough problems. Since their attack, the enemy stations black boats well out at sea to signal the alarm. Air sensors collate intelligence, organized flights of land-based defense fighters. Barrage balloons prevent low-level attacks, and concentrations of anti-aircraft send up a thick pattern of fire. The surface, here knocked out on April 3, 1944, was reported July 31, 1944, repaired and ready for action again. Against sea attacks, enemy destroyers scout the waterway approaches to the harbor, as do patrol planes. Small fleets of mine layers make these approaches hazardous. Hydrophonic detectors stand by to dispatch squadrons of fighter planes. And finally, coast artillery, light guns, big guns. A harbor is a good shelter. Booms, submarine nets, minefields, coast guns, anti-aircraft, nearby airports, radar. The sweeter the target, the heavier the shore defense. 
A live naval superiority may, of course, the Nazis and Japanese to landlock their warships for protection, but these landlocked ships nevertheless serve as threats to our convoy. High up in port and the light units to capture Vanguard against sneak hit and run raids. Enemy bridges could be blown up. Troop ships could be hit at the moment of disembarkation. Canals could be bottled up. Submarine pens put out of commission. But shore defense protects them well against normal sea and air attacks. Every major German and Japanese held harbor presents in itself a number of tempting objectives. All these and many more are choice targets. And yet to date, shore defense makes it difficult to destroy them without disproportionately expensive losses in men and equipment. In the spring of 1944 at Chesapeake Bay, a different form of attack was tested involving a single missile, which using special OSS techniques could get through enemy harbor barriers by deception, which could be precisely controlled to a specific target and which operating without personnel would be expendable. For purposes of this test, two men are used to take the motorboat out to its point of rendezvous with the plane. The plane carries on board the Campbell operator, who alone will control the motorboat, even though he will be miles away when rendezvous is established. The boat is a 34-foot A2 hacker craft with a low silhouette. Powered by a 550 horsepower engine, it can do 35 miles an hour for a range of 220 miles while carrying a maximum load of 5,000 pounds of explosives. The range can be extended by adding gas tanks. The craft is a projectile. It carries no personnel. In addition to its explosive charge, it has a radio control receiver and a television transmitter. The television camera housed in the white box on the bow is standard Army Air Force's portable equipment. In this test, a plane is used as a control. All the equipment the Campbell operator needs is a television receiver, including the screen, and a radio transmitter. Instead of the plane, the operator could be in a mothership, a submarine, another motorboat, or at a concealed position ashore. Preliminary tests having proved successful, Preparations were begun in August 1944 on full-scale tests involving actual operational factors. The SS San Pablo, a 5,000-ton freighter anchored in the Gulf of Mexico off Pensacola, was selected as the target. Work began on the disguise. For deception purposes, Campbell lends itself easily to a variety of possibilities as a fishing boat native to the area of operations, as one of the miscellaneous utility craft that crowd harbors, even as an enemy supply or light combat vessel, such as the German E-boat. In this case, the hacker was converted into a rusty, weather-beaten Danish Bristol fishing boat. The job, aging included, took a week. The choice of the fishing boat disguise is especially apt for an OSS sabotage operation. No matter how thoroughly guarded an enemy held harbor may be, the authorities, pressed for food, are forced to let the local fishing fleet continue operating. The missile, properly disguised, could be slipped into the fleet from a mother ship, from a submarine, or by OSS operatives working in enemy territory. Once inside the harbor, it would be guided by remote radio television control into the target. The hacker, converted into a Danish fisherman, rides heavy seas. The plywood hull built over the false frame takes the pounding with no sign of distress. The disguise, however, is not completed. To fill the giveaway speedboat across, special mufflers are attached. The motors themselves are soundproof by nailing thick layers of Celotex to the hatches. Provision is made to simulate the characteristic chug chug of a fishing boat diesel engine. To get back to the Danish fishing boat K354, Amo firmly grasps the tiller and the disguise is finished. The 
when up the vice makes contact, driving the two pins into the side of the car. The missile is subtle. The cables attached to the pin hold the explosives close to the ship. 25 feet below, the bombs will go off. Drop the disguise and the true nature of the craft as an attacking projectile becomes revealed. Television antenna and camera. Television transmitter. Radio control receiver. The B-17 used as the control plane is quickly fitted out for Campbell. Radio control equipment above. Below the television receiver. The rubber hood attached to the screen cuts off outside light and permits clear vision. The plane takes off to rendezvous with the K-354. So I think this is right around where my audio cuts out. Two men take the okay, missile out from got a little more. The operator is ready to take over control. The crew of the missile goes overboard, is picked up by the boat from which these shots were taken. The missile is now completely under the control of the plane. Okay, this might be where my audio cuts out. There we go. <laughs> so that's what we all wanted to see right there. So again, 600 feet into the air, that water went. Um, so all in all, you know, I would call Operation Campbell a success. It wasn't what the US military eventually decided to use to end the war. I think it would have taken maybe a little bit more effort than just dropping a couple of, um, you know, atomic bombs. And we can probably debate the, you know, the utility of that in the long run. But, but all being said, it did help end the war more quickly, probably than an operation like this would have. There we go. So San Pablo today, that's how San Pablo sank, where it sank off of Pensacola. Now today, San Pablo is one of our most popular dive destinations off of Pensacola. And I will say it probably is my favorite dive spot, not only because I love the history and the archaeology that's taken place at the site, but because it really is just a fantastic dive site. It's about nine miles south of Santa Rosa Island, where Pensacola Beach is. That's our barrier island. Um, and it's in about 80 feet of water. So it's what we would typically call an advanced dive. It's something below 60 feet of water and above 130 feet, give or take. The great thing about this particular shipwreck, because it was such a large metal hulled shipwreck, there is a lot of relief still on the site. And you can see even on this sonar image, um, those massive boilers that were on the vessel. You can even see some of the refrigeration coils as well when you're diving and we'll see that in a video here in a minute. So because of all this relief and because of the sheer size of the site, um, there is always a lot of marine life on it. We see, you know, Goliath grouper out there. We've, I've seen manta on, um, on San Pablo. There's a lot of great fish. It's a popular fishing spot as well because the fish are attracted to it. Um, lots of, you know, amber jacks, analmaco jacks, all kinds of dive life, sea life off of this vessel. Um, so not only is it really cool to look at, there's an amazing ecosystem that's evolved around this shipwreck site. And so what you're seeing here, again, like I mentioned, is a sonar image of what the shipwreck site kind of looks like today. You can see it's essentially blown apart there in the middle with some of those large boilers still hanging around. Um, and then, you know, parts of the bow and stern a little bit more intact at either end. 
Um, and then of course this image here is of one of those boilers. They're quite tall underwater. They're very fun to look at. Now, more recently, this dive destination, San Pablo, has become a part of the Florida Panhandle Shipwreck Trail. And the Florida Panhandle Shipwreck, Shipwreck Trail is a relatively recent program of the Florida Division of Historical Resources Bureau of Archaeological Research. And essentially, um, you know, using funding that was available after the Deepwater Horizon um, incident here in the Gulf of Mexico, they put together this trail of fantastic shipwrecks to dive from Port St. Joe, which is on, you know, further east, and then all the way to Pensacola, essentially spanning the panhandle of Florida, putting together 12 really amazing shipwrecks in a way that would attract divers to come back to this northern part of the Gulf of Mexico and get them diving on sites that have great history, but also are really great dive sites. Now the Florida Panhandle Shipwreck Trail is a great program. Not all of the shipwrecks on this trail are necessarily what we would call natural shipwrecks. A lot of them are artificial reefs that were sunk intentionally to create dive sites and fishing spots. San Pablo is actually one of the few sites on the Florida Panhandle Shipwreck Trail that is, even though it was intentionally sunk, it's, it was, it's a natural shipwreck and that it wasn't sunk to be a dive spot or a fishing spot. Um, one of the great things about the shipwreck trail is not only is it promoting diving in Northwest Florida, which is fantastic if you've never done it, um, it was also critical for creating partnerships locally with dive shops, with charter boat operations, with local hotels and restaurants, getting that tourism money back into Northwest Florida after Deepwater Horizon. So it was an absolutely fantastic project. It's still going today, and there are plans to expand it to include additional shipwrecks on the trail. One of the cool, if you're not familiar with the program, they did create a uh, passport, a Florida Panhandle Shipwreck Trail passport, which I, I think was an idea we may have stolen from the Florida Keys. But as divers go and visit these sites, they can get a stamp in their passport. And once they've collected all 12 stamps in their passport or stickers, they can then send a copy of that passport to the state of Florida, um, Division of Historical Resources, and they will get a certificate in return and they will also get a t-shirt as well. And I see a lot of uh, friendly faces in the, the meeting space today. I think some folks may have actually done this um, with their dive groups, which is fantastic. If you wanna check out the Florida Panhandle Shipwreck Trail, you can look at it online. Even if you're not a diver, there's some great videos and photos on there and information about the sites. Um, you can just go to the, the website, which is easy. It's floridapanhandledivetrail.com. And so I've got another shorter video here as we wrap up the presentation. And this is just gives you an idea of what the site looks like today if you were going to go and dive it. Um, the audio that was put on this video was, was a little rock and roll for the presentation. So I think I may have dumbed it down and not included it. I hope I didn't, because it is kind of loud. Um, if not, I can turn it down. <laughs> yeah, okay, I cut it out. <laughs> so divers on the site, not great resolution here, sorry about that, but you can see that they're on some of those larger boiler elements, how big those are underwater, how much structure and soft corals are growing up around the site. Look at all the fish that are out there. If you hit the site on a good day, it's an incredible dive and you can get some amazing visibility down there. See other components of the ship. We'll probably see some of those refrigeration coils um, that would have been used to help keep the fruit cold when it was being transported as a being used as a banana boat. There's those boilers again, big sheep's head. Sorry for the road noise. My office is fronting Main Street here in Pensacola. There we go. There's some of those refrigeration coils. Quite large and interesting to see in the water, unlike many of our other dive sites locally. And so I, I always like to wrap up, you know, with kind of the, uh, a message about underwater historic preservation, because I think we learn a lot about historical sites and archeological sites when we visit those places on land, because they often have preservation messages around them, but we don't often think about underwater sites as protected places and places worth protecting and preserving because of the value they bring to our communities, not only for education, 
I mean, these are cool sites that tell us about our collective histories, um, but they're also really important for recreation, fishing, diving, and in turn, that helps drive local heritage tourism. And the very smart people who created the Florida Panhandle Dive Trail understood this when they were putting that together. So like we said before, when we have amazing shipwrecks that are protected and amazing to look at with beautiful natural ecosystems around them, people want to come here for that. And so we want to encourage that. We want them to bring their money here and spend it in our dive shops with our charter boat operators, with hotels, with restaurants, um, all that good stuff. And so much like sites on land, when we visit national parks, when we visit state parks, you often hear them say, you know, take only photos, leave only footprints. Underwater, we have a similar saying, take only photos and leave only bubbles. And of course, you know, really our end goal is by doing presentations like these, by talking about underwater resources, educating people about them, because this is not really something you usually learn about, you know, in school or anytime after school. We want people to understand them and to appreciate them and then the hope is that if we can appreciate these sites as communities, we can work together to preserve them for all our sakes and for many different reasons, as we talked about. So that is the end of my presentation. And I wanna thank you all for being such an amazing audience today. If you're interested in archeology span in underwater archeology, span we have a lot of great resources online. There's our website, flpublicarchaeology.org. We also have a Facebook page. Um, which some of you are probably familiar with. We post all of our events on that Facebook page. And um, we also have a monthly e-newsletter. And so if you are interested in getting a monthly newsletter in your inbox with all of the virtual and in-person presentations that we offer, including dive training opportunities for dive instructors and recreational divers, that will come to you in that newsletter. And you can sign up for that on our website. We also have a YouTube channel. All of the Zoom into Archaeology presentations that we've done over the last almost two years at this point, most of them are available for streaming online. And those include topics in underwater archaeology, terrestrial archaeology, biological archaeology, you name it, we've pretty much covered the gamut in the last couple of years. And it's not just me giving those presentations. We have lots of outside researchers who come in and talk with us. So check those out. We have a lot of other great videos up there as well. Um, some great archaeology resources. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer. It doesn't have to be about this particular shipwreck. Or if you just want to make comments, feel free to unmute or use the chat box too. Um, thanks, Craig, for being here today. I appreciate it. I see lots, again, lots of friendly faces today. I appreciate you all being here. Sarah mentioned um, that her first dive was on San Pablo. Yes, San Pablo is such a cool dive site. Um, and I'm glad that some folks on, on the talk today have actually been out there. Um, I hope you enjoyed um, your first wreck dive. Pensacola, for those of you who aren't local, is a wreck diving destination. We don't often get the, you know, the tourism that the Florida Keys get, but I would argue that some of our wreck dives are even better than the wreck dives in the Florida Keys, if you catch them on a good day. Any other questions or comments? If not, that's fine too. Thank you all again for being here today. We have another Zoom into Archaeology talk later this month. It's going to be on um, African American Cemetery Preservation in Florida with some of our staff down in Gainesville area. And that's going to be really interesting because there's been a lot of talk about historic cemetery preservation in Florida. Um, Anita asked what the, the Russia story is. That's a really good question. Um, there really isn't a story there. I think because you know the shipwreck was, or the ship was sunk by a U-boat and there's all this talk of U-boats and sabotage and who are our allies in the war. I think it just was one of those things that like telephone, it just kind of became a thing over time. Nobody really knew why the shipwreck ended up there. They knew it had something to do with World War II, but what was it? And I'm pretty sure that that's how it got the moniker, the Russian freighter. It's a freighter, but it is not a Russian freighter. Um, Russia, you know, putting that in front of it makes it sound intriguing and very cool too. So I'm sure that has, that has helped its tourism um, at, over time as well. Um, thanks, Craig and Pat. Good to have you here. Betty, thank you for joining us. Renee, everybody else, lots of names that I recognize. 
Um, thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your day today. Um, this video will be up on our YouTube channel in a couple of days. So if you know anyone else who's interested in the site who may have dove it and wants to learn a little bit more about our history or the site's history, you can find the video up there as well in just a couple of days. So thank you all. Um, hope to see you again soon.